Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. This week, we're going to take a look at the wealth and income gaps that are emerging all over the world. You know, when people say that the crisis is over or some policies were effective in trying to right the ship of the economic state that has capsized, what they fail to mention is that the wealth and income gaps continue to widen. The poor are getting poorer, the rich are getting richer, and they use markets to do this. It's, uh, it's a complete misuse of the term market efficiency. There is no market efficiency. There's only wealth and pilfering at the highest levels all over the world, people who control these markets. Let's bring in Stacey Herbert to get more on this. Stacey, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Good to be here, Max. Actually, my first headline will go exactly with your introduction there. Developing Nations Storm Rich List as Mexican named number one. This is Carlos Slim, and um, he's now the number one richest man in the world, worth $53.5 billion, pushing Bill Gates into number two, who is worth only $53 billion, according to this list. But if you count the actual billions that Bill Gates has transferred to his charitable foundation, he's actually worth $80 billion, according to Forbes. Yeah, well, it's good PR for Bill Gates to do a little charity on the side to deflect attention, isn't it? <laughs> well, also, for, perhaps during this rising wealth and income gap, it's better not to be worth $80 billion. So the number of billionaires in the world swelled last year from 793 to 1,011. The proportion of Americans, however, on the top billionaire list dropped from 45% of the list down to 40%. That's right. The wealth is trickling down outside of the United States, because, of course, the U.S. pushed all their manufacturing capacity and wealth-generating, income-producing assets. They sold those or transferred them overseas, and now you've got billionaires breeding overseas while the U.S. economy shrinks. And the other interesting thing I noted in reading about these, um, this billionaire list is, you know, The Guardian describes Carlos Slim as a, he, he's a man criticized as a ruthless monopolist. Number two is Bill Gates. And of course, we'll cut to this little clip here. Microsoft is a monopolist and it engaged in massive anti-competitive practices that harmed innovation and limited consumer choice. So as you get these billionaires who are monopolists, of course, they're stifling innovation and making it more difficult for anybody down in the lower levels to even rise up because they dominate the field. Carlos Slim is the telecoms industry for all of Mexico and much of Latin America. Yeah, I know. And Bill Gates, of course, he got his monopoly position, intellectual property, rights on software. Now he's just using that same kind of mentality in the pharmaceutical business. And this is not necessarily doing anything net good for the globe because it's still somebody who's monopolizing intellectual property rights in a way that's causing a lot more damage than good. For every dollar Gates sp uh, spends so-called helping people, he causes $2 worth of damage elsewhere in the economy. We cover the top two, Carlos Slim from a developing nation, Mexico, and then Bill Gates. Number three is Warren Buffett, but number four and five are held by Indians. So number four is Mukesh Ambani, and his critics alleged his wealth is due to his ability to manipulate the levers of controlled economy to his advantage. This according to the Wikipedia on him. And Lakshmi Mittal, who his employees have accused him of slave labor, because these two guys are worth about $30 billion each. And here's a headline from last year. Average Indian's income crosses 3,000 rupees. That's $65 a month that the average Indian is making. Mm -hmm. The wealth and income gap there is so much more extraordinary than what it is in the U.S. But the U.S. is moving, of course, towards that. Right. I think that's the important thing to consider in this, uh, you know, quest toward globalization is that it's, it's not about spreading wealth around the world. It's about spreading this notion of inequality around the world and having these monopolists dominate at the top and having everyone else you know, the conflation of wages at the bottom and that the average wage in the U.S., for example, is heading down. It'll probably drop another 40 or 50 percent before the decade's over. And this is just adding fuel to this huge wealth and income gap. So how does Newsweek treat these stories? Here's the headline, the scary new rich. And they're not talking about the, the developing world billionaires. They're talking about the developing world middle class. So the global middle class is rising faster than expected in numbers and in wealth. Last year, 70 million people 
join the emerging market middle class. Just as we're losing middle class in America, 70 million new middle class participants in the rest of the world with incomes between $6,000 and $30,000. Goldman Sachs chief economist Jim O'Neill, who not only coined the term pigs for, to describe Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain, but he's come, he calls these uh, developing economy middle class as the story of the decade. But Newsweek says... The truth is that they, these uh, developing economy, middle class people, are not becoming just like us. That, in fact, they're nationalist and they're, um, they're a little bit anti-Western in their nationalism. I.e., they don't want uh, America to take their resources. And that apparently is, makes them bad, according to Newsweek. Yeah, well, let's also keep in mind that these, this new middle class in these countries, they're being breeded by the bubble breeders, and they'll get them hooked into real estate speculation or some other form of speculation. And in five years, ten years' time, their wealth will be confiscated as the wealth in the U.S. was confiscated, as the wealth in Britain has been confiscated. So, yeah, they hold out the carrot and they say, yeah, become middle class. And then they put you onto the speculative uh, ladder toward money heaven, as some have called it, when the money disappears suddenly, and now those people will be out in the street soon enough. Yeah, and then another example that Newsweek uses is the Chinese. Say, the increasing patriotism of affluent young Chinese has created an industry for popular books like The China Dream, which urges China to launch a military buildup in preparation for a coming conflict with the U.S. And Newsweek says is a reason why they're, no, they're not like us, like Americans. Mm. But, I mean, uh, Americans have invaded and occupied so many countries over the last few decades. How can they say at all that America did not do the same thing on their way up? Because they have the world's reserve currency and it hides a lot of propaganda. So, back to America. What's happening there? Headline reads, retiree confidence about comfortable retirement at generational lows, even as millionaire ranks jump by 16%. So U.S. millionaire ranks up 16% last year. So there are now 7.8 million households in America that are millionaires. This is down from the peak at 9.2 million. So the trend is still down. It's up from last year. But at the bottom of the, under the millionaire class, 43% have less than $10,000 saved for retirement. This is up from 2008 in terms of how few are prepared. So 43% are not prepared, 39% in 2009. So it's getting worse. Again, the trend is bad. Right. And uh, those, those millionaires you're talking about, of course, their wealth is tied into U.S. dollars and the U.S. dollars under attack from these emerging economies that are switching over to uh, currencies that are not based entirely on fiat fluff invented by Bernanke and Geithner and those folks in Washington who have been put forward this hologram of dollar security, which is ephemeral at best. So speaking of monopolies, this takes us to the healthcare industry in America and the banking industry. Goldman, insurers set to raise prices, walk away from consumers. Goldman Sachs held a um, conference call regarding healthcare industry. And Steve Lewis spoke on this conference call. He's a highly regarded broker at the world's third largest insurance broker. And he said that price competition between insurers was down from a year ago. Insurers are now willing to dump their clients because they have all the pricing power. They don't need all those people who won't pay enough money. So you're seeing increases in premiums in America on health insurance of 39 percent, even more. Yeah. Well, it Insurance is priced in America, and economics is called a Veblen price. They treat insurance, they treat health insurance like a luxury item, like a Mercedes Benz or a Tiffany watch or something like this. And the higher the price goes, the more people covet that item. They don't see it as a utility that everyone should be entitled to. So if the people who cannot get and were not covered by health insurance, they're considered to be losers, as you would think, oh, that person on Rodeo Drive in Los Angeles can't afford the latest fashion from some big name designer. They're losers. So they, they've totally transformed health from something that people would use and, and be access to as part of a human rights. They've turned it into a Chotsky that's in a gift bag at an Oscar Academy Awards ceremony. Here's the next headline. Insider trading in the in-trade prediction market uh, on healthcare reform. Yep. So 
Barack Obama is using, he's out right now campaigning around the U.S. trying to get people to support his health care um, initiative. But if you look at the uh, in-trade contract on the health care reform, apparently it jumped to above 60 percent. And Business Insider, who we had Joe Wiesenthal on last week, here's why you should take the in-trade health care betting very seriously. Now, he contacted in-trade CEO John Delaney, who said, quote, it is a reasonably active market, but atypically, a lot of the trade is coming from the D.C. area, when normally we might see trade coming from all the other major urban areas. Right. There's a strong case to be made that the in-trade virtual currency market is as manipulated as many of the stocks and bonds and currencies on any other market. And the news media reports on results on in-trade currency-based markets, so-called prediction markets, as news, as somehow it's reflective of the public mood, not taking into consideration that those prices are manipulated, and that, and that that price, when it's reported to the public, becomes a price signal to the public, who then believes that the trend has somehow uh, gone in favor of an outcome that's being engineered by the person doing the price manipulation. And of course, when you're using virtual currencies, it's a lot easier at this stage of the game than when you're using dollars and other forms of currency. So these in-trade virtual markets and prediction markets and other various markets like this are routinely manipulated. Remember, during John McCain's campaign in 2008, he manipulated his own contract to make it look like he was doing better against Obama. And we're seeing this all across the board. Of course, the box office futures contracts coming from Cantor Fitzgerald. I can tell you right now that we We've seen huge patterns of manipulation and price rigging in those markets without a shadow of a doubt. Well, you would know as the uh, creator of that, <laughs> yes, well, that I technology. Cr I created the technology in a way to prevent this type of manipulation, but instead uh, they use it to manipulate markets, not to manage markets. And the results are going to be catastrophic, as I predicted on the show. And my track record on predictions is pretty good uh, going back the last couple of years, just based on ferreting out all the fraudulent tricksters who are behind the scenes manipulating and rigging these prices. And unfortunately, due to this theory of market efficiency, people think prices reflect reality, and then they act. And instead of understanding that prices are being manipulated to cause people to act, so it's a bit of a tail of the dog wagging the dog. Okay, well, we got to move on. Thanks so much, Stacey Herbert. Thank you, Max. All right, don't go away. Much more right after the break. month we give you the future we help you understand how we'll get there and what tomorrow will bring the best in science and technology from across russia and around the world join us for technology update on rt welcome back to the kaiser report to learn more about inequality it's time to turn to kate pickett senior lecturer in epidemiology at the University of York. Kate is author of The Spirit Level, Why More Equal Societies Almost Always Do Better. Kate, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Kate Pickett, why does inequality matter? Inequality matters um, because it causes, it's the root cause of a whole range of health and social problems, but also because it damages not just the poor and the vulnerable in more unequal societies, but also the well-educated and the well-off. Okay, so uh, compare, for example, the health of the average American versus the average Brit and what that might tell us about inequality. Well, I'm afraid the health of the average American is worse than the health of the average Brit, um, but I'm also afraid that the health of the average Brit is a lot worse than the health of our counterparts in more equal societies, such as the Scandinavian countries and Japan. Um, the UK and the US are both pretty bad, actually, in terms of income inequality. We sort of come at one end of the scale, whereas countries like Japan and the Nordic countries come at the other end. Somewhere like Canada is rather in the middle. The, these are the rich, developed market democracies I'm talking about. And life expectancy is correlated with that degree of income inequality, as is infant mortality and levels of mental illness and obesity as well. So in other words, in Northern Europe, we're told, for example, oh, they're taxed a lot, 
and therefore it's such a burden on their societies. But apparently, no, in fact, those higher taxes result in a lot more equal societies, which have a net benefit of a society which fosters much more in terms of uh, cohesion, uh, living standards, educational standards, health standards, etc. Is that, is that true? Well, it's, it's partly true. But what we find is that there are more equal societies that get their greater equality not through taxes and benefits. So Sweden, for example, has quite high income differences to start with and, as you point out, has high levels of um, redistribution through taxes and benefits, and they seem to do very well. But Japan has smaller income differences to start with, um, doesn't do much redistribution or social expenditure, and it does equally well. So it does seem to be the, the income gap that matters rather than how you get there. And we find a similar contrast among U.S. states. Um, Sweden is, um, sorry, New Vermont is rather like Sweden. It does quite a lot of social expenditure, has quite good welfare benefits. And its next-door neighbour, New Hampshire, has smaller income differences to start with and one of the lowest levels of state expenditure of all. But because they're both quite equal, they both do very well. So it doesn't seem to matter how you get your greater equality. It just seems to matter that you get there. Now, the title of, of, the, of your work, The Spirit Level, why more equal societies almost always do better. Talk a little bit about the spirit level. What is the spirit level? A spirit level is what Americans call a carpenter's level, I believe, or a bubble level, or simply a level. It's that little tool um, with a bubble of liquid in it that you use to, to measure levels. And our publisher suggested it as a title for the book because we have a lot of graphs in our books showing different slopes um, between inequality and various outcomes. And I think they thought that that would be a useful image. Um, we as authors quite liked the notion of public spiritedness and a lot of people have told us they like that spirit is in the title because it suggests the greater social cohesion um, and community that comes with greater equality. All right, so how do you get around this uh, pushback from people who argue that any time you try to engineer equality in a society, you're going down the path of socialism and that this is stifling innovation and you end up with statism? Well, I mean, I think there are two responses to that, um, and clearly that um, idea is wrong. None of the countries that we look at are socialist countries, in fact. They are all rich market um, democracies. They are all capitalist societies. But some are more egalitarian than others, and they clearly do better. And also we've shown that a measure of innovation um, is statistically significantly better in the more equal countries. What we did is we had to sort of think of, of a proxy measure for levels of innovation. And so we took the patents granted per capita in different countries. And that's significantly higher in the more equal ones. And that's probably because in less equal countries, there's less social mobility, more children drop out of education. And so there's more of a sort of a waste of human talent, if you will. More unequal societies are not actually fostering the creativity, the human capital, of the vast majority of their population. So they're wasting an awful lot. Okay, and uh, looking at the globe now, which countries, you talked about different countries, which, which now represent uh, the most unequal, according to your work? Well, among the rich developed countries, it is Singapore, the USA, Portugal and the UK. We're sort of at the bottom. Um, there are much greater levels of inequality in some of the developing and emerging economies. But for them, economic growth is still a sort of a pressing need. Um, whereas our analysis is concerned with what do you do when you've really got to the end of what economic growth can do for you. Okay, and you recently went to the United States with your findings. In the U.S. did uh, yes. the tour. Uh, what was the response like there? Well, it was overwhelmingly positive. We were very pleased. We went to six different cities, including um, Atlanta, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, um, and Washington, D.C., and we spoke to various audiences. You know, we spoke to academics, we spoke to economists, we spoke to um, civil servants, we spoke to community groups, and all the time we heard people telling us just really the same messages as we hear when we present the work in the U.K., that what we're giving people is evidence that their private intuitions were right all along, that inequality is damaging to society and socially corrosive 
Now, of course, we're speaking to self-selected audiences who've chosen to come and hear us, and I'm sure there'll be、um, other people who disagree. But since our book was published in March, we've spoken in a number of different countries to all kinds of different groups, and we've never actually come across a, a sort of robust、um, rebuttal of the evidence that we're presenting. Nobody's been able to suggest a better explanation of the patterns that we find. So, what is the, the, the chief corresponding? What is the chief contributing factor in these countries leading to this economic inequality? Well, it varies from country to country. I mean, we saw enormous rises in inequality in、um, the English-speaking countries under sort of neoliberal ideologies about economic growth.、Um, In other countries, the pressures to develop greater or lesser equality sort of come from different historical processes. It's almost always、um, political ideology that drives those changes, sometimes in response to external threats. But they're not just things that are particular to different countries. It's really important to remember that all of the analyses that we show, we do them twice. Once. Among the rich, developed countries, and then we repeat everything for the 50 United States and find exactly the same patterns. So what we're seeing is not something culturally specific to particular countries or time periods. The same pattern is drew, true across the 50 states of the USA. The more unequal ones have more health and social problems of every kind, and yet clearly there are not enormous cultural divides、um, across the United States. So it's definitely something about the inequality itself. All right. So in the U.S., you mentioned neoliberalism as a chief contributing factor to、uh, uh, to inequality, and of course, neoliberalism is a the, the, the notion that markets are the best arbiter of、uh, distributing wealth and risk and income throughout the society. And、uh, but but apparently, this this blind belief in markets or a market fundamentalism, as some have called it. Seems to be、um, absolutely delivering the opposite. Markets seem to be delivering inequality and not equality. So why isn't there it, it, more an attack on the basic assumptions of markets themselves? Because the markets themselves are actually、uh, given this blind faith, which seems unwarranted. They're actually engineering、uh, inequality and social upheaval at this point. Because now you see in the U.S. there's pockets of social unrest and, and violence as the inequality gap gets wider, due primarily, as you point out, to neoliberalization and markets. So why isn't there more of an attack on the basic functioning of the market system itself? Well, I think there is starting to be,、um, and we've had really the same phenomenon here in the UK. You know, for a long time, a belief in in the benefits of markets and that、um, trickle down from economic growth would benefit all of us. It's really only recently, with the economic crisis, with the credit crunch and the global recession, that I think people have started to question that and and started to really look at the evidence and see. That it,、um, those market forces have not brought about the benefits to the wider society that we expected. When I was in the U.S. recently, I picked up a copy of the New Yorker, and there was a major cover story about the debate currently going on among academic economists about this. So I think it's it's rather. Like trying to sort of turn the Titanic, you know, we've been we've been following a particular path for quite a long time, and it's rather hard to change、um, academic opinion and public opinion. But I think there's a real public space for debate about inequality now. Sure. Now, in, in the wake of the recession, when, when inequality gaps become so wide, you're talking about human rights abuses, more or less, is when you see this, these these inequalities become so so large, and then you've got. Basically,、uh, despots, despotic regimes, and and the people that they are ruling over, and in the U.S. now, this、uh, this is also a trend in that you've got incredible concentration of wealth in the monopolists and and the、uh, would-be aristocrats and monarchs in the U.S. and it's becoming a human rights abuse. So instead of just academically saying, well, markets might have an impact on this. On these human rights abuses, doesn't it make sense to take the people who are putting these markets out there, like the Wall Street banks, take them into court under human rights abuse acts, and say, "Look, you're creating human rights abuses, and you need to you need to be prosecuted as such." This is not just an academic exercise. This is genuine. This the, the, people are suffering in in a great in a great way、uh, because of these banks and the, 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 what they're committing in terms of human rights abuses. Is there an initiative to take these? Bankers to, down to a court of law and prosecute them for human rights abuses. 
I haven't heard of anything like that. Um, and I think, you know, it, to put this in terms of human rights, um, it, it might be helpful, certainly if we're thinking about life expectancy. It's clear that for the poorest people in our societies and those in the most deprived areas, they are deprived of, you know, actual years of life due to inequality. But it's also really important to remember that it's not just a difference between the very rich and the very poor. All of these problems have social gradients. So if you are a well-educated, well-off um, American or Brit, um, if you were at the same socioeconomic position in a more equal society, you would be doing better as well. So it's in the interests of all of us, actually, to create more equal societies. And we need to do it in, in all kinds of ways. And I think probably using any kind of strategy to hand, whether that's trying to have a progressive taxation um, strategy or whether it's trying to reduce income differences to start with in the workplace, perhaps by putting constraints on the bonus culture and on the remuneration committees that have allowed those um, income differences to grow so big. Okay, well, clearly in the U.S., with the health insurance industry, their message to the American public is you're more valuable to us dead than alive. So if the U.S. doesn't want to act in the face of this tyranny, you know, it's, it's a shame on them. All right, Kate Pickett, that's all the time we have for this week. Thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you for having me. And that's going to do it for this edition. I want to thank my guests, Stacey Herbert and Kate Pickett. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.